Hello, I'm Mike Buchanan, and today I'll be having a discussion with Janice Fiamengo, a woman I've admired greatly for years. Janice is well known, of course, as a men's rights advocate, but what is less well known is that she began her career as a literary scholar, earning her PhD from the University of British Columbia with a dissertation focusing on the 19th century social problem novel. In 2008, she published The Woman's Page, a monograph about Canadian women who worked as journalists and social commentators in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. She has also published extensively on Canadian writers, including the novelist Sarah Jeanette Duncan and the humorist Stephen Leacock. Our discussion today will be about the poet who, in my view, and that of many others, was the greatest poet ever to write in the English language. William Topaz McGonagall was of Irish descent. He was born in Edinburgh in 1825 and spent many years as a weaver before discovering his true vocation, writing poetry, in 1877 at the age of 52. He died in 1902. Janice, a very warm welcome. I was delighted to discover recently that you too are a huge admirer of William McGonagall. I wonder if you could start by saying what it is about William McGonagall's work that you admire. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for uh, allowing me to come on and to discuss this brilliant man. Uh, he is a, an, a, just an amazing poet in many ways and also a very engaging and interesting personality. Uh, he was largely self-taught. Uh, he had a natural poetic gift. Mm. There was nothing academic about his writing. And in fact, he claims that uh, that kind of supernatural mm. force invited him or even commanded him, uh, perhaps not unlike mm. Cadman, uh, as, as depicted the, the herdsman depicted by the Venerable Bede being called to sing of creation. Uh, McGonagall also claimed that he was called by a supernatural force to write poetry. He heard a voice saying, write, write. And he did indeed begin in the tradition of the greatest bards. Mm. And um, he, he's not uninteresting also uh, from a, a men's issues perspective. Uh, the gender politics of his poems are also very interesting and, and notable. Uh, these are manly poems about masculine endeavors. We have um, great battles. Mm. Uh, we have uh, heroic endeavors. We have the works of men. We have the, the um, great monuments and buildings that men create. Uh, and a great mm. emphasis on um, masculine heroism and masculine community. So for these reasons, he's also very interesting. Thank you, Janice. I, I couldn't agree more. I wonder if you could start by introducing us to his poem, The Famous Tay Whale, about a humpback whale spotted in the Firth of Tay, the estuary of the River Tay, the longest river in Scotland in 1883. Yes, indeed, the famous Tay Whale, uh, one of his best, mm. um, well, the, probably the best of this brilliant poet. It's a riveting poem about the harpooning of the whale and the great courage and the zest for adventure manifested by the fishermen uh, who went out to engage with this beast. Now, this is a long poem, and, uh, but I do want to give our viewers a flavor of it. So I'm going to read a few stanzas and then we can discuss in a, in a bit more detail and, and read some more. So here it is, the famous Tay Whale. And, and, and you'll notice that as we begin, the, the first stanza sets the time and place uh, with particularity and it introduces us to the subject of the poem, the monster whale, as McGonagall specifies, this is not just any whale. And you'll notice that the rhyme is very marked. And this is the sign of a master poet that we really hear that rhyme. We are also told in the opening stanza, uh, we're, we're, we're taken actually into the consciousness of the whale. This is a very unusual poetic technique um, indicating the remarkable virtuosity of this poet. So here we go. And then as we, as the introduction, introduction develops, we actually hear 
the speech of these men of the sea. Mm -hmm. We have a, an oral element introduced, so we, we get a flavor of, of their speech. So here it is. "'Twas in the month of December and in the year 1883 that a monster whale came to Dundee, resolved for a few days to sport and play and devour the small fishes in the silvery tay. So the monster whale did sport and play among the innocent little fishes in the beautiful tay until he was seen by some men one day and they resolved to catch him without delay. When it came to be known a whale was seen in the Tay, some men began to talk and to say, we must try and catch this monster of a whale. So come on, brave boys, and never say fail. Then the people together in crowds did run, resolved to capture the whale and to have some fun. So small boats were launched on the silvery Tay while the monster of the deep did sport and play. I think those last two lines are quite brilliant. We have the wonderful contrast between the men on the surface of the sea and the monster whale beneath the surface. And, and it's, it's a, a wonderful foreshadowing of the coming confrontation between the two, which is going to be, of course, the climax of this wonderfully engaging narrative poem. Mm. Thank you, Janice. That, that was beautifully narrated. Um, can you per perhaps explain um, why you think um, McGonagall is considered such a great poet? And do you personally believe he was the greatest ever poet writing in the English language? I think it's fair to say that he is the greatest poet in the English language. And certainly I'm not the only one to, to mm. think that. Um, one of the first people that he sent his poem to, the first poem that he wrote, uh, sent back a note saying, Shakespeare never wrote like this. So that tells us a great deal, I think. Um, McGonagall's poetry exhibits all the features of truly great poetry. And um, I would identify those as follows. One, I would say we have to have a universal theme or a theme at least that is widely accessible to readers across many cultures. Uh, you know, it's no, no uh, happenstance that unrequited love happens to be a major subject of poetry. And in this case, of course, with McGonagall and the, 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 the uh, famous Tay Whale, uh, we have the confrontation between man and beast, between the human and the sublime other. And this is a perennial theme of poetry and very well handled, of course, by McGonagall. Now, uh, another um, feature of great poetry is that we must have beautiful sound and beautiful form. The poem must engage us and enchant our ears. Poems were originally intended to be heard aloud, either to be sung, sometimes, sometimes accompanied by uh, an instrument, um, mm -hmm. or, or at, at least to be spoken aloud, and, and they're still meant to be heard in the mind's ear. And, and McGonagall employs rhythm and rhyme to masterly effect. The third thing that makes a great poem is uh, vivid and precise diction, the best words in the best order, and to create memorable imagery. And we certainly have that in McGonagall's um, narrative depiction of this exciting confrontation. And then finally also um, metaphor, simile, other types of extended comparisons to create dramatic scenes and um, uh, engaging ideas. And certainly we find that we have the whale, of course, uh, compared to a monster. Uh, you know, what a what an amazing choice of words there. And we have at a very interesting point in the poem, <clears throat> the men on the sea attempting to harpoon this whale being compared to baboons. Mm. And this is a very, very interesting, I don't suppose it was simply for the rhyme. It's a very interesting um, metaphor, uh, raising the question really of perhaps whether there is a slight eco-poetic critique here asking us, who is the real beast? Is it the whale? Or is it actually those fishermen who are attempting to harpoon that whale? Uh, so there's such complexity as well as such 
beauty and memorability in this poem that I think it, we truly can say it is, it is absolutely great. So, so would you say he was a man, gosh, what a century or more, almost ahead of his time, you know, in, in, in concerns over, you know, man and, 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 and nature and, and so on. It's, 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 it's there is remarkable sensitivity, isn't it? There um, is indeed, there is uh, sensitivity <laughs> and complexity because he also does not disavow the excitement of this contest between man and beast. So he, he, he doesn't take one side. Mm. And, and that I think is part of the um, moral profundity that we find here with McGonagall. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you, Tess. Very interesting. I'd like to turn now to a British academic, Victoria Bateman, uh, professor of English at the University of Swindon. And um, I believe you were at a conference in Verona in 2011, during which she presented for the first time what, what is now widely known as the Bateman scale of poetry quality. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I think that's perhaps the only paper I remember from that conference. Uh, it was so striking. And it mm. is now generally understood that um, the Bateman scale of poetic value uh, absolutely revolutionized the field. Um, uh, it is a poetic assessment tool of unparalleled quality and accuracy. It allows us to assess poetic quality with great precision and rigor. And uh, in fact, it, it happens that the, the Bateman uh, assessment tool uh, has scored McGonagall and this particular poem, the famous Tay Whale, with 100 points out of 100. It's the only poem in the English language that's ever been scored in that way. So, uh, you know, I think we can agree that um, there's no question then about the value here. And it had just so happens that uh, uh, there is no uh, female poet who has ever written a poem that achieved more than 53 points on this very accurate scale. And I must go on to say that no feminist poet has ever written a poem that achieved more than 11 points. So it tells us a great deal. And now if, if I may, I'd like to read just a little bit more of the poem, just so that our readers will have a flavor because the, the, the climax of the poem really comes with this confrontation mm. and it's really um, quite gripping. So if I could just read a few more stanzas and perhaps make a few comments about them. Now, what happens here uh, as the confrontation develops is that we have this marvelous yoking of uh, contrarieties, um, what some scholars call the juxtaposition of incongruities in the description of the of the whale as both fearful and beautiful. And, uh, and we also have um, marvelous descriptions of the determination of the men under extremely trying um, physical and indeed geographical circumstances uh, as they are drenched in water, and yet the difficulty of their task merely increases their zeal and determination. So here we go. Oh, it was a most fearful and beautiful sight to see it lashing the water with its tail, all its might, and making the water ascend like a shower of hail with one lash of its ugly and mighty tail. Interesting too, isn't it? How the, the water ascends like a shower of hail. Very interesting mm. and intriguing simile. Normally we think of hail as descending. Here it right. ascends. Yeah. Then the water did descend on the men in the boats which wet their trousers and also their coats. Mm. I like that striking particularity there. I mean, it's one thing to have your trousers yes. wet but to have the coats as well, yes. it's really something. Yes. But it only made them the more determined to catch the whale, but the whale shook at them his tail. Notice the increasing tension here. Now we have the will of the whale pitted against the will of the men. Then the whale began to puff and to blow while the men and the boats after him did go. A bit of poetic inversion there armed well with harpoons for the fray, which they fired at him without dismay. And they laughed and grinned just like wild baboons while they fired at him their sharp harpoons. 
but when struck with the harpoons, he dived below, which filled his pursuers' hearts with woe, because they guessed they had lost mm. a prize, which caused the tears to well up in their eyes. Wow. That is a very striking image, isn't it? The tears welling up in the men's eyes because they realize at this point that they have, and in fact, they have lost their prize. The whale has managed to dive down, has broken the, uh, the, um, uh, the harpoon attachments uh, and they have lost their prize. But what happens in the rest of the poem, of course, is that the whale swims north uh, and uh, eventually, a, a week later, is, is seen by another group of fishermen floating dead in the water. The whale is then towed to shore by these men. Eventually, the whale ends up back in Dundee, which is McGonagall's hometown. Uh, he is dissected by a professor um, from Aberdeen, uh, professor of anatomy, and eventually, the whale is actually uh, taken by an uh, entrepreneur of the area and displayed in his, in his yard. This entrepreneur, whose name is John Woods, uh, charged money for the uh, villagers of Dundee to observe the whale. And the poem ends with the description of the interest of the villagers in viewing the whale. And here's the very last stanza which ends on this note of jubilation, then hurrah for the mighty monster whale, which has got 17 feet four inches from tip to tip of a tail, which can be seen for a sixpence or a shilling, that is to say, if the people are willing. So we end here. Um, this is a narrative uh, ballad tradition at its finest. We get a strong sense of the community here coming together to observe the whale. Uh, and of course, our focus is on the valiant fishermen who represent that community. He is, he is just, I mean, genius is not too strong a word, is it? For finding rhyming words. I mean, you mentioned earlier on baboon and harpoon. That's it. Um, it's, you know, he, he is in a league of his own. Um, th th thank you, Janice. Um, he was, as you know, though, not only a great poet, he, um, he was uh, something of a, of a thespian. So uh, I wonder if you tell us something about William McGonagall, the actor. Well, that's it. This is the, he was truly a Renaissance man in that sense. He was a man of many parts. Uh, he used to, while he was working at weaving, he would recite passages from Shakespeare to his colleagues. And uh, they were so impressed that they convinced a local theater owner uh, to allow them to get up a production of Macbeth with McGonagall in the title role. And one can only imagine, I mean, we lament that we do not have any, any recording of mm -hmm. his um, wonderful work, I'm sure, uh, in the role of Macbeth. And he was so dedicated to the part that believing as the play progressed, believing that the character, the, sorry, the, the actor who was playing the character of Macduff was jealous of him. At the end of the play, McGonagall in his role as Macbeth refused to die. And I, I think we really couldn't find a more imaginative and dedicated um, profession of his faith in Shakespeare's play than that. So possibly a rare example of someone and not even a professional actor um, improving on Shakespeare. I mean, that's, exactly. that's really quite extraordinary. It is. Um, Janice, thank you. I, I'd just like to say a few words about public recognition of this, of, of uh, the poem you, you read from, the famous Tay Whale. It was set to music by the Hungarian-born British composer Matthias Sieber in 1958. The premier performance of the work, scored for orchestra, foghorn, espresso coffee machine and narrator, took place at the second of the composer Gerard Hoffnung's music festivals with Edith Evans in the role of the narrator. In 2013, the, the poem was scored for two choirs by the Finnish composer, Jaco Mantijavi. Now I'm sure I'm gonna get some complaints from Finns for mispronouncing his name. And I'm told that the Finns can get pretty grumpy during their long, um, harsh winters. So I look forward to the emails. 
The piece was commissioned by clubs at Yale University and Princeton University and played it during their centennial pre-football game concert. I'll have to see if I can find um, that on YouTube or something. That, that, that would be something, wouldn't it? Certainly would. Mm -hmm. um, my copy of McGonagall's poems, collected poems, and this particular edition was, has an introduction by Chris Hunt, which I can strongly recommend. Um, the, the, the book is one of the most treasured books here in the main library at Buchanan Castle, my main residence in Scotland. 563 pages of the most sublime poetry ever written. Treat yourself to a copy if you can. And with that, Janice, I'd like to thank you warmly for shedding so much light on the work of, of William McGonagall, a giant in the world of poetry. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you very much, Mike. I've enjoyed myself very much. Thank you.